These days, we're not competing with the law firm down the street. We're competing with the Amazons, the Zappos, the Mandarin Orientals of the world. That's Paul Llewellyn, co-founder of Lewis and Llewellyn and the author of Unshackled, Reimagining the Practice of Law. So I want every touch of my firm to be a concierge white glove service. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Paul Llewellyn to discuss why many lawyers enter the legal profession with admirable goals, but often face disillusionment, dissatisfaction, and burnout, the changes necessary to create a more humane and human-centered profession, and why great attorneys are made, not born. The great thing about law is you're always learning. So I don't profess to know everything. I don't profess to get it exactly right every time. So I think just that culture of learning, what can I do to support you, my colleague? What bar associations are you interested in? Where would you like to speak at? And what can we do to further your career? How can we help you develop business? And again, it's that just support to our team members, developing them as lawyers, developing their career. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Before we begin today's episode, I want to remind you that we aren't beholden to any sponsors or run any ads on this podcast. This allows us to present all of our episodes raw and unfiltered. I'm not going to push any made-to-order meal services on you or try to save you any money on your car insurance. That being said, I have one small request. If you receive any value from this podcast, please give it a five-star review. Pay the fee so we can keep this podcast free. Well, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I love doing these in person. It's just like a different dynamic, I'll tell you, than when you do them remotely and and virtually. Nothing necessarily against that, but we're obviously going to talk a lot about your book. You and I have known each other for a while. Congratulations on published author, Unshackled, Reimagining the Practice of Law. What compelled you to write this book in the first place? I love my job. Every morning I wake up, I'm excited to get to work. But so many lawyers, they hate their job. High levels of dependency, depression, tragically suicide. Clients often don't like us, and I wanted every lawyer to feel like I do about their job. And it's interesting because it seems like there's multiple audiences for the book. There's obviously lawyers, law firm owners. It seems like even those considering entering the practice of law and and even law students, that you're giving them kind of an all access. This is really what it's like. Maybe it's not what you grew up watching, whether it was like Suits or any of the, the legal TV shows. I know you even mentioned that throughout the book. Why is it so important to provide that perspective? Law school does a terrible job preparing people for the practice of law. And sure, in law school, you might read Supreme Court opinions. That's not what we do on a day-to-day basis. So much for our job, it's talking to clients. You're on the phone. How do you deal with difficult clients? How do you get business? First and foremost, we are a business. And it's just not taught. How do you get clients? That type of thing. Business development, servicing clients. How should you treat clients? And so I wanted really to anyone in the law, considering a career in law, all the public at large, this is what it is. And let's be candid, there are problems facing our profession. And how can we make it better? I think just saying, well, look, this is how it is. That's not an answer. Right. And so I certainly don't profess to have all the answers, but at least I wanted to start the conversation. Yeah. So I'd love to go back a little bit. If you could speak to your background, obviously people with the 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 British accent, but now you you obviously you live in California. If you kind of speak to your journey and how you entered the practice of law. Absolutely. Yeah. So I grew up in England and the reason I became a lawyer, the reason I wanted to be a lawyer was they show LA law and no longer around. It first aired in the mid 1980s. So I was about 10 years old and it was set in this fictitious law firm, Mackenzie Brackman, Cheney and Kuzak. And they had the family lawyer, the criminal lawyer, the civil litigator, and it glamorized the practice of law. It was exciting. Each episode dealt with, there were some heavy issues, but justice pretty much was always served. So growing up, age 10, I announced to my mother, that's the job I want. I want to be a litigator in Los Angeles. 
And I didn't yet know how I would do that, but I knew that's the life I wanted to live. And so then I studied law at Oxford University in England, and there was a firm in LA that had a program where they would take an Oxford law grad to spend a year at their firm in Los Angeles. So this was my dream opportunity. I'd get to live LA law for at least for a year. So I did that. I was a law clerk. I loved it. And I went back and I became a barrister, which is the English equivalent of a trial lawyer. You may have seen the wigs, the gowns on, on TV. And I was a criminal prosecutor in England, did that for about three years. Great experience. You know, I was trying cases every day, but the California itch was still there. And luckily then I got a call from that same firm that I worked with in California. And they said, would you like to come out full time? Would you like to be a lawyer in Los Angeles? So the fact I'm sitting here now, pretty obvious what I decided. So I took the California bar and that was 21 years ago now. When you got to, to Los Angeles, what was that like compared to what you were seeing on LA Law? Yeah, to a certain extent, it was more exciting. And of course, you know, in LA Law, every case lasts one episode. You know, I was exposed to the realities of litigation. It can take years. But the cases we worked on, the trials, in my view, there is no greater drama than a jury trial. And I got to work on some great trials. And when the jury announced its verdict, like I said, there is no great attention. What are they going to do? So it's interesting in the sense that it seems like the general public loves any sort of legal show, legal drama. Judge Judy is one of the highest paid women on television, as you describe in the book. And yet the legal industry as a whole does not have the best reputation. So I'm curious, why do you think that is? I think many reasons. I think to a certain extent, we are set up for failure because you mentioned shows like Suits, Ali McBeal, The Practice. And I think justice is quick in those cases. Justice is normally served. No one's talking about the bills or the long hours or the stresses. And I think clients often come to us at some of the most challenging times in their life. Someone's been in a catastrophic accident or they're going through a divorce or they've been charged with a, a crime. So often they're coming to us at these challenging times in their life. They have high expectations often set up by TV. And I think the realities of the profession can be hard hitting for people. What, you mean it's not going to be resolved right away? You mean it's going to cost me how much? And I think also sometimes just the media is just false in their portrayal of lawyers. I talk about it in the book, McDonald's coffee lawsuit. You mention that to most people. Well, that's crazy. She spilled coffee on her and she got millions. You know, I talk about the real facts of that case. And there have been hundreds of burns. The temperature McDonald's was serving coffee, as alleged in that case, would cause burns in just a matter of seconds. And ultimately, the awards was in the hundreds of thousands, not in the millions. And certainly, we have problems in our profession, but the McDonald's coffee lawsuit is not one of them. Yeah, it's interesting. I know in the book, you describe that, you know, when you're watching this on TV, you see someone that, you know, they meet the client, then they go straight to trial, then they have some amazing outcome, with, you know, with the jury, and then that's it, it ends. But they, no one talks about the marketing meetings and operations and developing the firm's culture and all the things that happen in between and like the time spent working on the case and all of those different challenges that arise, that really is the reality of the profession. So what do you do about that? Like, how do you essentially bridge the gap between what consumers, even the general public believes their experience should be with a lawyer and then what it is? I think two ways. I think number one is within as lawyers, how do we treat our clients? I think managing client expectations. You know, I do civil litigation and clients are often shocked to learn only about 1% of civil cases go to trial. So the chances we're even going to trial are very slim. Managing their expectations, this is going to be a long process. It could be an expensive process. Giving them the budget at the outset, keeping them informed about what's happening um, in the case. And then the second branch, like I said, is educating the public. Who is the public? It's our friends, it's our family, our colleagues. And so getting the word out about the profession Almost all lawyers I know, they're good people. Most people become lawyers because they want to do good. They want to serve their clients. They want to dispense justice. So I think we need to try and bridge that gap between the perception and the reality. And speaking of that, I know you talk about just when most people think of law firms, they think of the portrayal even of big law, right? And yep. yet a lot of our audience and the people listening to this podcast are solos, small firms, some even mid-sized firms. What do you find are the biggest differences between the two? So I was fortunate enough to, I worked big law for five years. I had a wonderful experience of big law, but big law, that's not the typical public is not their experience with lawyers. So often big law, you're working on bet the company litigation, primarily representing fortune 500 companies. You know, there can be tens, hundreds, millions, even more at stake. 
Whereas obviously the smaller firm, typically, not always, but typically less at stake. Often you might be representing individuals as opposed to the larger corporations. So yes, there's differences there. The amount at stake might be different, but I think the principles I talk about in the book can apply equally. Firm culture, how we treat our colleagues, how we treat our younger lawyers, how we service our clients, how we treat our clients. In my view, there is little difference as to how we should approach them. So let's actually just talk about both. I mean, on the notion of firm culture, why is this such a challenging concept? I don't know if it's a challenging concept for people to grasp, but it's, it seems like if you look at most law firms, culture is not what they're known for. Right. Like, why is that and what do you think could be done? Part of the reasons I co-founded the firm with Mark Lewis just over 11 years ago is basically the firm I wanted didn't exist. The firm we wanted didn't exist. So let's create this firm. And the bedrock, one of the bedrocks behind the founding of our firm is we want to create a firm where people want to come to work, people want to work at, where we treat each other with the utmost respect and we treat our clients with the utmost respect. And Sounds like, reasonable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not rocket science. But even how lawyers treat each other and, you know, often we, we've all heard nightmare stories. The partner holds on to an assignment and gives it, you know, 6 p.m. on a Friday, once it by my Monday or people shouting at each other. And it's just unnecessary. Why can't we just treat each other with kindness, with respect? Even our terminology, I'll never refer to my secretary or my paralegal. Everyone at my firm, I always refer to them as my team member or my colleague. We are one team together. We don't have cases where this is my case. This is one of my colleagues' cases. Every case is a case of the firm. And it's things like that, even down to terminology, to create that culture, to create the respect. A lot of our lawyers have young children, myself included. Again, family first. If anyone's going through something in the personal situation, what can we do to help? Can we take the workload off from you? You know, it's your birthday. Here's a bouquet of flowers. Here's a gift certificate to your favorite restaurant. Treat yourself. We realize how hard you've been working. Just simple things like that to show that we value our team members. I think whenever someone hears what you just described and this idea of really prioritizing culture and treating your team with respect, I think there's always going to be some people that say, well, that's nice, but I'd love for you to speak on what kind of impact has that made? Because you've come from both sides. You've been in, in organizations where that culture was not a priority and you obviously at your firm it is a priority. What type of impact has that made perhaps on the growth of the firm, people's engagement, the work that you're doing for your clients, client satisfaction, that, those sort of things? Absolutely. So I think it's had a very positive impact. So we're now about 20 lawyers. Every one of our lawyers has joined us from big law. And so they clearly see something in our firm that other firms uh, can't offer. And I'm proud of the fact that in 11 years, no attorney has left our firm to go to another firm. And that's the statistic I want to keep. It's something I'm very proud of. And for example, we go on an annual retreat, the whole firm. And so in September, we went to Scottsdale, Arizona, 25 of us. There's no boring agendas. There's no sitting in conference rooms. It was cocktails by the pool. There was top golf. There was having dinner together. And it really felt like going on a, a long weekend with 25 friends. And that is just so important to me, the culture. That's something that we want to cultivate. Yeah. And I think one of the other things that you speak about in the book that perhaps is a bit non-traditional, and I'm glad you touched on this, is that many firms that have kind of the billable hour model, you have a different perspective on that, right? right. I, I'd love for you to speak about that. And then also, obviously with billable hours, in many cases, it just kind of decentivizes efficiency, right? So what's your perspective? Yeah. So I'm certainly not the first person to talk about the billable hour, but this is my perspective. You can build a skyscraper for a fixed fee. You can build a nuclear submarine for a fixed fee. Yet, Somehow we're incapable, you know, we write a letter or a motion. No, sorry, I, I couldn't possibly do that for a fixed fee. The trouble with Bill Blower is it always equates the time spent to value. But there is a disconnect there. Sometimes an hour of my time, I talk about in the book, I wrote one letter and it saved a multi-million dollar merger. That had delivered a great deal of value to the client. Right. Other times I might be in a deposition and my opponent's fumbling with exhibits and I'm just having to sit there. At that moment in time, I'm not delivering as much value to the client. Yet the billable hour, it values it exactly the same. Another problem with the billable hour is it values inefficiency. Most firms have the billable hour target and the higher billers are generally rewarded with higher bonuses. And to a certain extent, that might be warranted. But there could also be a lawyer who's incredibly inefficient and effectively is seen as a superstar in the firm because they're taking longer. If you go and take your car to the car wash, you don't say, well, how many minutes is it going to take? Or someone mows your lawn, well, how many minutes is it going to take? 
Yet we've all become so ingrained as lawyers that, well, no, this is the only way that we can bill. Now, to be clear, my firm does offer the bill of blah. Many clients still want the bill of blah. That's completely fine. And I'm on board with that. But I don't even like the term alternative fee arrangements because it assumes the bill of blah is the norm, is the correct model. Right. So we also offer fixed fees. We offer almost like a subscription model where per month, how much it costs per month, early resolution success fees obviously on the plaintiff side, contingency fees. So one of the first things I ask any potential client is, what are you looking for? Here are some options. Here's a menu of options. Is certainty in legal spend more important? Do you want the billable hour? So really put it in the client's control. What do you want? Instead of just assuming that every client wants the billable hour. Yeah, I love that. It's just meeting them where they are. And, and to your point, if you look at it from the standpoint, the value you're providing isn't necessarily based on the time you spend working on something. It's ultimately your years of experience, knowing how to solve the problem. I know you give this example in the book about at one point was an engineer or someone who was, was billing someone. They said, well, how much? And it was, I think it was like a dollar for the screw and then $9,000 for the labor, right? Or just getting this done, right? So knowing how to solve the problem or which screw to turn. Exactly. I, I give you another example in the book, the heart surgeon. Someone's trained 30 years to be this heart surgeon. If you need heart surgery, the surgery might take 30 minutes to save your life. But what's the value of that 30 minutes to you? It literally saved your life. Yet no surgeon would think, well, here's my billable hour and here's half an hour. Why as lawyers do we think, well, no, this is how we do it. Sorry, we can't do any better. I know you mentioned Joseph Jamel Jr. in the book. And for somebody who doesn't, who doesn't know who this is, if you could speak to that, and then some of the lessons that you pulled away from them. Yeah, so he was certainly a lion of the Texas trial bar. He was named in the Fortune 500 as one of the 500 richest people in America. So he was very successful. But basically, he lamented the lack of going to trial now. And so many litigators, they're basically paper pushers and they don't actually try cases. I was very fortunate as a barrister in England, before I even moved to America, I got to try about 100 cases to verdict. So I was very fortunate to have that experience. But I think so many lawyers now, they, we've sort of lost the art of the trial now. And in my view, that's a shame. And I also think it puts litigation in perspective because often we're fighting, you know, over a footnote in a discovery response and you realize at trial it doesn't matter and i think if more people went to trial we may spend less time paper pushing fighting over things that don't matter and really focusing on what the true issues are and ultimately that would save our clients money now having said that though i think that you also mentioned that there are a lot of challenges right now in the justice system because of how it just gets bogged down with frivolous suits, I think how inexpensive it is to take a case to trial right now in California. Exactly. What, what can be done about that? It's a problem. Absolutely. Justice is very expensive and it can cost hundreds of thousands or more to actually get to trial. So I think number one, this is not popular, but we need more judges. And why I say it's not popular, vanity project like a bridge, well, everyone supports that. But if a politician stands up and says, oh, we need more judges, it's not normally a vote winner. But it's so important to the functioning of society. And so I think, number one, we need to invest more money in the court system. And number two, I think judges need to, when they see a frivolous suit, be prepared to sanction more. There are lawyers, unfortunately, who do bring these frivolous lawsuits in a hope for a quick settlement. And I think if we call that out more, hold people's feet to the fire and more and say, look, I'm not going to stand for this. Hopefully it would discourage such a practice. And along those lines, I know you also talk about the lawyers of just wanting to encourage more like ethics and civility you know, just amongst the profession. I, I know there's sometimes from a, a consumer standpoint, they see someone on TV and they say, I want a really aggressive adversarial trial lawyer because they associate that with a successful trial lawyer. But you argue that oftentimes that's not the case. Exactly. I, I've never had someone come to me and say, I want a mild mannered litigator. Everyone always says I want an aggressive litigator. And I always tell clients, look, I'll do aggressive tactics. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean you have to bang your fist on the table and shout at your opponent. And I think it was instilled in me, the English training, the English bar, civility, how we treat each, each other is just instilled from the very first day as a barrister. For example, in England, you have to refer to your opponent as my learned friend. And that's an example. You walk into court, you have to bow to the judge. You leave the courtroom, you have to turn to the judge and bow when you're leaving the courtroom. Just things like that. It might seem antiquated, but I think it just leads to the civility among the profession. Also in England, there aren't that many barristers. So the chances are you're going to have the same opponents again and again. So you don't want to get a reputation of being the jerk. Whereas in America, my experience, at least in California, certainly many lawyers are wonderful and civil, 
but there's other lawyers that see fit to shout, to demean, to insult, and ultimately it's not helping their case and ultimately it's making it more expensive for their clients because you're engaged in unnecessary disputes a lot of the time. So I always tell my clients, I think you're far better served when I get on very well with my opponent. Like I said, we can both advocate fiercely for our clients, but that doesn't mean we can't be cordial and professional towards each other. From what I've you know, I've heard, I think a large majority of your cases come by way of other lawyers. I mean, they're referred. About 95% of our cases come from our lawyers and often from my former opponents as well. Yeah. And to me, there's no greater compliment when my former opponent is sending me a case. And so, yeah, how we treat each other again, it's good for business. Yeah. So one of the other things I found interesting that you, you mentioned in the book, and it's puzzling to me why this doesn't already exist, because you look at other industries and other professions like the medical profession, where you have almost different apprenticeships and fellowships and, and so on. That doesn't really exist in the legal profession as someone's trying to determine what area of practice they'll be working in. What are some of the things you think need to change in terms of preparing people during law school and even after law school? Yeah. So like you said, you can pass the bar here and you're a lawyer the next day you can open your practice and you wouldn't want your doctor to do that. Suddenly be operating. There's the residency. And again, I talk a lot about my training in England, but to be a barrister, there was a one-year mandatory apprenticeship, which is called pupillage, where effectively you live the life of a barrister for a year. You go with them to court every day, sit in on client meetings. Now, I think we could benefit from that here, some type of mandatory apprenticeship. It could be, for example, a year at the law firm. In England, the other branch of profession, solicitors, you're called a trainee solicitor for two years. And you do four different practice groups for six months, you get exposed to different practice areas. Now, could it mean a short-term dip in profits here? Yes. But ultimately, if it improves retention, if it makes for more satisfied lawyers, ultimately, I think it will be worth it for both the law firm and the clients. I also think we can teach this in law school as well, about the business of law, what it actually means to practice law. It's all very well learning about the constitution or property law, but Chances are that's not how you're going to spend day in, day out arguing about the constitutionality of something. Right. But you are going to have to hustle for business. You are going to have to service clients. And again, that's not something that's taught in law school. I think it was interesting to me that in the book you mentioned that I think the most effective laxative for a lawyer is their first time in front of a jury. Yeah, first time in court. Yeah, I remember a barrister telling me that there's no greater laxative known to man than your first court appearance. I think, and I think that's true. Yeah, but it also highlights the fact that someone's almost being thrown into the deep end, right? Of how much preparation they have in advance of that, right? How much training do they have? How much experience do they have just leading up to that? Because, I mean, I've heard from lawyers that have been very honest with me that they say the first time I was in court, I had to message people, other lawyers that I knew, asking them, which side do I sit on? Exactly. No, I remember my training in England. I was a junior barrister. And in England, you do law as an undergrad degree. So 21, you have your law degree. You can be practicing law 22, 23. At the time, I looked a lot younger. And so I looked like I was 12 trying cases. Yet you've got to come across as confident in front of your clients. I used to prosecute in an area of England called Essex and in particular a town called Grays, which has been given the accolade, the most hideous small town in the British Isles. And when you're dealing with bar fights in Greys, you soon get that confidence in court. Yeah. What were some of the types of cases that you were assigned early on? I mean, because you said you had like 100 trials to verdict. Yeah, so it would be the US equivalent of misdemeanors. So it would be in a typical day, you might try like four cases. And so it would be bar fight, bar fight, DUI, bar fight. I remember once someone punched a soccer referee. And then another bar fight to end the day. There you go. A lot of bar fights in Essex. But it prepared you. Exactly. Not lucrative. I remember, you know, typically for a trial, you get paid 40 pounds, which is about $50. And often the peak train fare costs more than I'd actually get paid. So I actually lost money some days, but I would not have given up that experience for the world. I'd say to any junior lawyer, if you can get that trial experience, ultimately it will serve you well in your career. And you argue that great attorneys are made and created, not born. Right. What is it? Is it just the experience that they gain when they're doing multiple trials? Is it also what other aspects are happening within the firm? Because I know you focus a lot on developing your team. Absolutely. So I think I was fortunate enough that firm in LA, the lawyers I worked for, they were great mentors. Before I even took my first deposition, I'd sat in on about 40 depositions because they wanted me to get that experience. They'd take me to trial with them. I got to see them in trial. And I think just exposing people, just number one, to the experience. And number two, an example in my firm, it's not just an upward culture. So for example, I will do a first draft or an email to a client or a letter. Then I'll send that to one of my colleagues and please edit this, please comment on this. The great thing about law is you're always learning. So I don't profess to know everything, 
I don't profess to get it exactly right every time. So I think just that culture of learning, what can I do to support you, my colleague? What bar associations are you interested in? Where would you like to speak at? And what can we do to further your career? How can we help you develop business? And again, it's that just support to our team members, developing them as lawyers, developing their career. You know, you talk a lot about culture again in the book. How have you been able to sustain it, right? Because I think sometimes people hear about culture and they look at it as a to-do list of saying, well, if I put this in place and then we get the benefits and then we do all these different things that are good for culture and then several months go by, six months go by and they say, well, it was great before, why is it not still great? Yeah, so I think it's always changing. For example, some of our lawyers are remote now. So it was easy when everyone was in the office every day because you can always, oh, let's get lunch, let's get coffee. Whereas some of our lawyers being remote, it's harder. So for example, four times a year, we bring the entire firm to San Francisco. We get together in person. I've already talked about the retreat, the in-person retreats, just check-ins. Like we have a mentorship program. Every one of our younger lawyers is assigned a partner to be their mentors. Pick up the phone. How are you doing? How often do we do that? Just... It's not to talk about a case, just checking in. How are you doing? As simple things like that. And again, never taking culture for granted. Yeah. I know you also talk a lot about just customer service, client experience, all of this touch points. There's, a, there's an example you actually give in the book where I think you were speaking with a client at one point and you saw something on the chalkboard behind them. If you, if you That's right, yeah. That. So I was on the client Zoom and I saw on the chalkboard behind him, 11 days to a carbo. And so I started off, oh, what are you doing in carbo? Which hotel are you staying at? And then immediately I have one of my colleagues contact that hotel, get a gift certificate to the spa, and then waiting for him when he got there was the gift certificate. So simple touches like that. Um, I talk a lot in the book about gift giving. And I know you've had a guest on your podcast, Michael Woolin, Giftology. John, yes. And he talks about the worst gift you can give is a bottle of wine. And yet at Christmas time, people go on autopilot, here's a bottle of wine. Why is it a terrible gift? Well, the person might not drink. You might send them white wine, they prefer red, or they might prefer gin or whiskey, etc. The other reason it's a terrible gift, they drink it and they will never remember you again. So we never send gifts at Christmas. We're not Scrooges because you're then lost in the rat race. So we typically send out gifts twice a year in March and October. Straight away, that puts us above the crowd. We agonize over these gifts. What can we give people something of value, something of worth? And we took the concept in Giftology of knives. We sent knives one year. And think, well, that's a strange gift. It's something you use every single day. It involves people's family members. And whenever they use that knife, I hope they think of our firm. So that's an example of just going above and beyond. Even the packaging we send gifts in, we have custom boxes made. We think about the thickness of the tissue paper. We do notes handwritten by the partners in the firm, just simple touches like that. And these days, we're not competing with the law firm down the street. We're competing with the Amazons, the Zappos, the Mandarin Orientals of the world. So I want every touch of my firm to be a concierge white glove service. And people say, well, you're a lawyer. Why do you think about that? We are in the service industry. That's yes. what we do. Yes. Um, a few years ago, I went to a conference in Las Vegas. It's the largest sales conference in the world. 10,000 people. I did not meet a single lawyer there. Well, ultimately, that's all we're doing. We're selling our time. We're selling our service. So any lawyer that thinks, oh, that's beneath them, I know I don't do sales, then I think they're just going to get left behind. Yeah, I agree. And, and if you could speak to, in the book, you outlined kind of your client journey, perhaps some of the different aspects that make the firm unique of what you do that's more customer centric at, at each point. Absolutely. So from the very first touch for our firm, say someone emails me, I'll respond to that right away. I might not be able to call them right away but I acknowledge them. I tell them when I'll be in contact. In the first intake call or, or meeting, I always ask, what's an ideal outcome for you? What are you looking for in this process? I think as lawyers, too many of us often assume we know what the clients want. Some people, it's, I just want to get rid of this as quickly as possible. Other people, money's no object. I did nothing wrong. I want to fight this till the very end. So I never assume what the client wants. And then every step along the way, I'll thank them. I'll typically do a handwritten note for engaging our firm. No one gets notes anymore. Everyone just sends an email. So straight away, it's, I appreciate the, the trust, the confidence you placed in our firm. And then along the way, I always want to manage my client's expectations so they know what to expect, what's going to happen next, what the budget is for the next phase. And then at the end, often I'll have a lunch or dinner with the client just to, again to show that I appreciate the business that they gave to our firm. 
And again, just as we get many of our cases from other lawyers, we also get many cases from former clients. And again, it's always very satisfying when a former client refers cases to us. And I know you, Michael, talk about people being a member of your cult. And I know cults get a bad rap, and to a certain extent, they deserve it. But as you've pointed out in the past, Apple's a cult. You know, why else would you camp out on the sidewalk overnight? Nike is a cult. And ultimately, is it's advocates for your firm. That's what we want to develop for our firm, just basically members of our cult advocating for our firm. Yeah. I mean, you can't spell culture without C-U-L-T, right? So and even along those lines, so if somebody's listening and they're hearing about a lot of the things that you're doing, the nice touch points, the client gifts, the thoughtfulness, and so on, it is all great. I think from a client experience standpoint, obviously, it makes somebody feel good, makes them feel valued. It's important. But then the, why isn't everybody doing it, right? Is it just because they either don't believe the outcomes that come as a result of it, they don't want to spend the money, or they just have a very kind of short-term focus? Yeah, I think fortunately as lawyers, there's a very low bar. So I think if you do just some of these steps, you immediately stand out from the crowd. And I think just it hasn't been taught to them. It hasn't been part of their developing as a lawyer. And so even some of the biggest law firms in the world, every December, I get an e-card, literally an email. The last thing I want in life is another email. These are often multi-billion dollar organizations. And this is the best marketing you can come up with, an e-card. So things like that, if these multi-billion dollar organizations aren't doing it, then they're just not seeing it. Well, well, why should I do it? Yeah. And I think too many people, they just, well, this is how every other firm does it. So this is how it must be done. And what I talk a lot in the book is, well, no, step back. Just because it's been done like this before, it doesn't mean it's the best way forward. Yeah. And, and so much of this is, is interesting as we've been speaking about this, so much of it is the difference between a long-term focus and a short-term focus in the sense that if you believe that you're going to still be around and your practice is going to be around, let's say 10 years from today, what are the types of actions and decisions that you need to make today to set yourself up for even greater success 10 years from now? And I find that most firms don't do that. It's interesting. You, I think you mentioned even on the, on the topic of like big law early in the book that most of these associates are working for two to three dead partners, right? right. That they're continuing to extend their legacy. Exactly. They've been long gone. The mission, the vision, all of that has been lost in a lot of these larger firms. But then if you even look at it, let's say a smaller firm, a solo law firm, it's even then so much of the focus is this month or this week rather than what about this time next year? Exactly. No, I, I have a section in my book and it's headed why boutique is best. I'm obviously biased because we have a litigation boutique, but I think it really is the best of both worlds. I remember someone at a big law firm, he was a partner, and he said, yo, I went to the annual partner meeting, and I thought it strange. I was shaking hands with people, introducing themselves, I am your partner. And the idea that I'm shaking hands, that to me isn't a true partnership. And I'm so fortunate at my firm, like literally my partners and I, we would do anything for each other. And it really does feel like that we are a true partnership. And I think clients see this, that we have each other's back. We will absolutely go to the bat for our clients. But also, I think they can see that we genuinely enjoy what we do. And if the people who are going to read the book or listen to the audio book, if they could take away one thing, what, what do you hope that is? It's hard to distill it to one thing. But I think how just really focus on how we treat each other as lawyers, how we treat clients, how we service our clients. Take a step back and, you know, can I do better here? Even am I treating my colleagues the way I would want to be treated? It's a stressful job. It's long hours, stressful situations. And let's not make it worse by treating each other like jerks, basically. Right. Yeah. So obviously you've grown. The practice has been growing tremendously and it's continued to scale and expand. You've had several phenomenal multi-million dollar verdicts. And I'm just curious, Paul, how do you define success? Yeah, it's hard to distill it to one sentence, but I think practicing law at the highest level I would go head to head with any law firm in the country. And so I would take on litigation of any size. So to me, that's success. And if clients can see that, we're fortunate. We represent some of the largest companies in the world. They can pick any law firm. And I think the fact that they pick our firm, that makes me very proud of my team, what we've developed. Yeah. And I don't know if you can name some of them, but that to me is, is just always is so incredible in the sense that they can pick anyone. And these are multi-billion, sometimes multi-trillion right. dollar companies right. that choose to work with your firm. So if someone's listening, thinking, I don't stand a chance, how could I possibly compete for the same type of clients or cases that these other massive law firms are gaining? I would consider, you know, perhaps taking a page from your playbook. Yeah. Like, so when Mark Lewis and I, when we opened the firm, we met each other at Latham and Watkins, which is the largest firm in California. Like I said, had tremendous experience at Latham. We opened with no clients. And so literally we opened for business. We shared an office. 
It was something that we couldn't even schedule phone calls at the same time because we were in this little room about the distance you and I are from each other. And so we opened with no clients. And fortunately, we had our first client within an hour. And fortunately, it's grown since then. And here we are, 11 years later, we've got 20 lawyers, world-class attorneys from some of the largest firms in the world. Our client roster is basically a who's who of Silicon Valley, as well as individuals as well. So we just did it by hard work and dedication. So absolutely, we did it. Anyone can do it. First client within an hour? First time now, the phone literally How did this come to be? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) And also, I think people wanted, before I set up the firm, no one's gunning for Big Law. And again, I'm not here to trash Big Law. I had a great time there. But no one's saying, gee, I hope Kirkland Ellis makes it this year. I hope Sullivan and Cromwell make it. I think deep down, a lot of people have respect for people that go out on their own to build something. And I've had so many people saying, I wish I did what you guys did. It's too late now. I'd now you know, got the kids tuition, got the big mortgage, but I just wish I'd had the guts to do it. And so people want you to succeed. Fortunately, we've had tremendous support along the way. So as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, Paul, what does being a game changer mean to you? I think to me, it means not accepting the status quo, not going down this path because that's how it's always been done. That's how everyone else is doing it. And so I think forging your own path forwards, taking risks and have fun doing it. I want to give a huge thank you to Paul Llewellyn for taking the time to speak with us today. And I want to thank you, yes, you, for listening to this podcast and for your commitment to growing as a leader. If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that I can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of my book absolutely free at GameChangingAttorney.com. Number two, you can shoot me a text at 404-531-7691 and I'll answer any question that you've got for me. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it'll help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on our interview with Paul Llewellyn, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. Oh, 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 oh